And we're continuing our talk topic on the expected occupancy. We kind of took a week off and spent time at Easter. We're able to glorify God and remember who He is and remember what He's done for us. We're going to get back on track. We'll be ending this in the next few weeks, and I think we'll say all we need to say. Remember, we're, we're dealing with the, the topic of God's sovereignty versus man's free will. Are we the ones that really, God's kind of set up the game, or we play the game, we get to the end the way we want to? Or is God the one really controlling the moves? Has He had it all set out for us from the beginning? And again, as I told you over and over again, it's not going to be an issue that's going to separate us as a church. Because it's just not that important. It's really not. And if you want to be a teacher and teach the young kids, and you say, I don't believe in Jesus, but I want to be part of your church, we'll have an issue because that's a trouble, trouble spot because we do believe that Christ is the Son of God. And so we'll have an issue there. This is one of those things that as long as you're walking with the Lord, it doesn't matter. But I don't want you to ignore God's powerful passages, the ones that maybe we can't necessarily understand. I think we can if we just spend a little time on it. I don't want you to be afraid of topics. We're not going to be a church ever that's a, a church of fear. We're going to tre you know, just trek out there out of faith, and God's going to lead the way, and we're going to walk out there as strong as we can, knowing all we can about Him. But we can't ignore these passages. This is because you may have had pastors that have said, we believe all in free will, or I believe all in God's providence. That may not make it right. Again, I'm not preaching this emphatically. I'm preaching this more like a teacher would. I want you to work through these passages. I'm content how God's working out my life. I think I've got it figured out. I'm content with that. How you come down doesn't matter as long as you're walking with the Lord. Whether you say, I accept the Lord today because I'm making this happen, then make it happen. If you accept the Lord because you said, the Lord has called me and I'm going to walk with Him because I believe from the beginning of the foundation of the world He called me, good for you as long as you're walking with the Lord. I don't care. But I want you to know these passages. And again, our, our main scripture that we've been dealing with for the last several months is Roman, out of Romans 8. And I picked it because it has all the scary words all at one time. And once we say these words enough, we're not afraid of them. And we can deal with them honestly. So let's read this out together. Say it with me. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn of many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. God is good. We've got to give Him glory on all things. Do you know that most of us are under some kind of mind control all the time? you know that? One way or another, we're being manipulated. Whether you know it or not, we're being manipulated. And especially if you look at things like marketing. Cindy's father was a big marketing person. Her brother now has a company like that. He does that. And he has, you have to know people very well. Because you're motivating them to buy something they may not buy on their own. You want to make them do something that they probably wouldn't do, give them the opportunity just to rationally think about it. You want to make their an impulse decision. Or you want to color something a certain way that is more appealing to the eye. All of this is psychology. They know how to manipulate us real well. All the time we're being mind control. Advertisers do this all the time. Every major ad that you see on TV, they spend a huge amount of money just researching how to put it together just so that it's the most appealing. You'll want to go out and buy that new car or go out and buy that new kind of bread or whatever it is that you're they're trying to sell you at the time. Research, research has shown you, many of you may take medicine, medication of some kind. Research has shown that even the color of pills will help you feel better about it. We all know what a placebo is. Placebo is something that's given that really has no medicinal effect at all. But it's all here. And when they've kind of proven it, again, you've got to take back there. She just got her, she got pinned, and she's all a famous nurse now, so she knows all about this. Congratulations. But you look at it, you look at these kind of things, sleeping pills are usually green or blue because they tend to be colors that are more warm and would make you want to sleep. Psychologically, they're trying to affect you with the color of the pill. Your painkillers are almost always white. Again, if you take any medication, look at your pills and see if they're going to fit in this. Because white tends to make you think strong. It's going to go attack that stuff and tear it up. It's just one of those things. Heart medications usually are red or brown. Again, you may have a heart medication that's purple. But for the most part, they're red or brown. You know, again, warm colors tend to make us think they're more potent. Again, psychology of this stuff is amazing because there's a lot of money. If you want to sell something, you've got to know how to make sure that people want to get it. And they'll want to grab onto it. Again, we can be manipulated by wording. Always listen to the 
verses, the way that the words are said, or the speaker, or the voice that he uses, or the, the kind of the way he breaks it up. Listen to those things. There was a good uh, example of this with reference to Obamacare. If they switched one word out and changed it by 33%. If you looked at the sentence here, it says government administered health insurance plan. 60 per 66% like that government administered. But when you change the word administer to run, government run health insurance plan, only 44% of people like that. So we can see that a word can change a lot. So when you're taking a poll, try to figure out what they're really trying to get you to do. Because one word might make you think this is a great thing, but really you would have never thought about that at the beginning. And so understand that even polling or word communication, people can manipulate you to do things you would have done. Buying cars. The facial expression on a car is something that will motivate people to buy certain cars. The word pareidolia is the word that is the phenomenon where we tend to see faces in things. You know, we all do that. You've seen Abraham Lincoln in the clouds or the Mary, the mother of Jesus, in burnt toast. The Catholics tend to see Mary a lot because we're looking for her. They're hoping to see Mary a lot, so they're looking for her. And so these kind of things, everything we're looking for is a face. They've shown that family cars, are like you know, soccer mom cars, tend to have happy little faces on them. Soccer moms want to have a happy car that all the kids get into. You know, look at that. But you look at the sports car, the sports car is going to have more of an aggressive look. The same car with reference to Honda, one looks happy because it's a soccer, soccer mom version. The other's got a little hot, hotter engine in it, goes a little faster, a little more aggressive. You see the end, you know, the face is a little tougher on it. You, you go to the, the supercars, they're just going to be downright nasty looking. <laughs> They want to chew you up, and you want a car that looks like it's going to chew up the road. Again, this is the kind of thing we're all motivated differently, and they know how to manipulate us. Today, we're going to see how there's good old-fashioned manipulation from the beginning. We're going to see if we can kind of trace that back. Has God done this in the past? Has God totally controlled someone for His will? We're going to go to this morning. So turn to the book of Romans. Get your Bibles out. I like it when you've got your Bibles. I always have the words up here, but if you've got the Bible, you might as well open it. Kind of, we'll work that thing back. It's written by Paul. He's the theologian of the New Testament. And when you deal with Paul, you've got to spend a lot of time on the Greek. Because he's always saying something down here that we don't get to English. Almost always. There's a secondary meaning that's running underneath. This takes a lot of time to read it. Paul wrote Romans to reveal God's sovereign plan of salvation. He was showing the Jews and the Gentiles that they both fit into this plan. Remember, the Roman church was having a lot of trouble. And when you get in trouble, when things get tough in your life, you tend to revert to it normal, natural state. So the Jews were going more traditional. They were reverting back to the Old Testament ways. The Greeks, they had no reference for that, so they were doing what they would do with reference to their religions. So we had all this dichotomy and this disunity in the church. Paul's trying to say, live a righteous life and be harmonious. Live together. The minute we start becoming factions in this church, we are useless to God. I'm going to do always what I can to keep us on track. Here's the one thing we care about. Now, you can spend some time with these little things, and you do good too. But here's where we're going. And you'll, think, you'll see me kind of spend a time with you. All of a sudden, I find out you're trying to send us into another way because as, as the leadership, we're doing what we can to find what God's plan is and head that way and only that way. Again, I'm blessed to have leaders that are really on their knees. We pray for months about every decision. We don't spend, we don't do anything quickly. I mean, Brandon, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be voting on him and spend time with him this weekend, next weekend. I will have spent time with him about seven months on this thing by the time he actually gets here. I'll be glad it's over, let me tell you. Nothing is fast in that. It's been a great time. Buddy, I love you. Uh, I'll be glad it's behind me. We move on to bigger, better things because he is a great man. But nothing, we're not going to move quicker than everything. We're going to seek God's heart. We will wait for him to move before we go. And so this is what's going on in the Roman church. So we're in Romans 9, verses 14 to 18. I want to honor God's word, so please stand as I read it says, what should then we say? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells, tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he shows mercy to those he wants to, and hardens those he wants to harden. Let's pray together. The Lord, you're almighty, you're powerful, Lord. I thank you that you have everything in control, in control, and you know what's going on. I ask this morning, Lord, you show us truly what you want to show us in each of our hearts. We say this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. A little bit of backstory. It's been a couple of weeks since we 
talk about this. We're starting to get into some of the neediest of all concepts when it comes to election. Again, those are the words from the beginning. You hear the word Calvinism, you hear election, you hear the reform movement, you hear God's choice, or, or any of those words. This is what we're talking about. Has God worked it out from the beginning? Has He chosen His specific people? And again, this is not going to separate us, but I want you to have to think about this. Who is God, and truly, what does He have planned for all of us as a whole, but for your life specifically? So two weeks ago, we began chapter 9. Chapter 9 is where most people get scared about and they want to just kind of jump over and move on to 10 because 10 gets happy again. But at this point, we found that Paul's heart is broken. We started chapter 9, he's broken. He wishes his people would accept Christ, and Paul's people are the Jews. They're the ones who should accept Christ. They know all the prophecies. If anyone knows their word, these people know it. It's transferred from, child to parent, from parent to child from the beginning. They had these things memorized. To be a priest at this point, you had to have practically the whole Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament memorized, and much of the rest of it usable so you could work around it. And so we see that these people took God's word seriously. He explains that the people are the promised are not those coming from Isaac, but those that are of Isaac. And again, if you miss any of these sermons, everything's on the website. It's a very usable tool. It's a good website. We've got it up today. I haven't got time to explain all the differences here and what, what it really means. But just because you were born from Isaac in his line does not mean you're getting to heaven. That's simply what he's saying. You have to be of Isaac. The spirit that Isaac had, the love that he had for God, that's what made Isaac great. Not his progeny and not all the, the DNA that was in him, but that he loved the Lord. We've got to have that spirit. Not be from Isaac, but of Isaac. Those of Isaac will follow God and listen to his leadership. The Jews are at this point are mired in tradition. And they have taken their faces from God, which is most churches today. I've been in a lot of churches that were beautiful, that were just flat. There was no real spirit, there was no love of God in there. They did church because it was a good tradition for them. It's the best way to get on the city council to be a deacon. All these kind of things I've seen this game played over and over again. And we're just whitewashed tombs. And that's not what I want for us. That's why I really feel a different sphere here. Because God's doing neat things. We're not coming for any other motives than we just love the Lord. It's not just because it's Sunday at 11 we're here. We're here hopefully because we love God and we want to give back to Him. So the, the Jews are in this problem. We, we do not need to be in this problem. Isaac never had that problem. Now, he made plenty of mistakes, but he followed the direction of God every chance he had. Again, we all make mistakes. If we look at these great patriarchs of the faith, and it reminds us that no matter what you've been through, God can use you to do powerful things in His world. So be, be excited about that. Paul goes on to say that God can make decisions that he wants to irrelevant of us. All the way through, Paul's saying, God is God, and we are not. That's simply enough. There's no either way to say it. He should have wrote that down. I'm going to, when I get to him, I'll say, why don't you write these? These are great words. Why don't you say this? Thing? He should have said, God is God, we are not. That would have been just as clear as it could be. But God was very clear the way he wrote this. He was speaking to these people specifically at that time. He goes on to say that God can do these things, and it reminds us that God chose Isaac over Ishmael. He chose Jacob over Esau, even though Jacob and Esau were twins from the same parents, and Esau were first. It doesn't make any sense. It also says that he hated Esau and he loved Jacob. Again, it doesn't make any sense because they had done nothing at this point to, to engender themselves to God. They were just being born. But God saw something different in them, and He wanted this one to be His nation. God doesn't have to follow our conventions or tra traditions. You look at 13. I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Again, that tends to make us kind of concerned. It makes us not feel good. But that, that doesn't sound fair. Remember, when you're thinking fair, you're thinking fair with reference to a corrupt and broken world. God is always fair, and God makes the rules. Just because we come down here, we tend to make our own set of morality doesn't mean that it's right. We have to get back to what God wants and understand that He's in charge of these things. And so we see that God hated Jacob. He saw that He loved Jacob. And the word there is hate. There's nothing secret about that word. It's not that He hated their lineage or that He chose one over the other. We talked about this. He hated one. He loved the other. I can't determine how, what, that, what He really means other than that's the word they used. And so today we'll see another example of a person God uses for His purposes. We're going to see that. We're trying to kind of work through this. Does God use people to bless his own people? Again, this is for the sake of God showing himself mighty. 
Everything he does is to show himself mighty and to bless his people. So understand that when you look at God. So there are four things I want you to know this morning. Four things. The first thing that you need to know that is that God is just. God is just. Look at verse 14. What should then we say? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. It starts off with, then, what then shall we say? Now, this is a frequently used expression by Paul. He says this quite a bit. And he says this before he's about to voice an objection. Now, understand, Paul's good at anticipating problems and anticipating questions. Remember, when these letters were written, it took them months to get there. So Paul didn't want to send this letter out there. It takes two months to get there. They finally, oh my goodness, what does this thing mean? Let me write a letter back. It takes two months to get back to Paul. He writes this letter. It takes two, one, two or more, three more months. This is half a year. They've been teaching false doctrine the whole time. When they got these letters, they started teaching from what their apostle, their leader, their church guider would tell them. They started teaching these things. And so if they had kind of false doctrine or things that they just didn't quite understand, they'd teach that until they got it cleared up. And so Paul's wanting to voice these objections before. So he knows they're going to ask this thing, so let me ask it for you. Again, he, the letter's too, too long for them to, to wait for another question. He doesn't want this to take that long. So he says the question here, is there injustice with God? And the word injustice is adikia, which means unrighteousness. Now the word dikia is the word righteous. And we put an A on it, it would be making it 180 degrees in reverse. And so instead of righteous, it's unrighteous, like moral and amoral. It's the same kind of thing. We still add A's to the words today to, to flip it around 180 degrees and make it be the opposite thing. And so really the word not here isn't just, it's, it's unrighteous. Is God not unrighteous in what he's doing? Paul's been setting up this argument to this point. Is it right for God to reject those legally coming from the line of Abraham? Again, we talked about this last time. Is, this what, what, is it right for him to do this? Is it, is it unjust? Why should he reject Esau or Ishmael when they were the firstborn? Technically, Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham at that point. He was before, born before his brother who actually would lead the nation. Again, why should he, the Greeks be chosen if not all the Jews are? Again, Paul's asking this question because he knows they're going to be asking another. So he's already anticipating the question, is God unrighteous? None of this sounds fair to you. Anybody say it doesn't sound fair? Let's just be honest. It doesn't necessarily sound fair to us, but God is God. And it doesn't matter what we think is fair. It really doesn't. He's not concerned about our fairness. He's concerned about Him being shown holy and righteous and that His people are blessed. That's all He cares about. We see what happened in the Old Testament many times. He used all these nations around Israel to bless Israel. He would destroy a whole city just so that they would have a city to move into. This is the God that we serve. A God that loved his people enough to remove the objects, objections and all the obstacles around him. This is the God we serve. It doesn't sound fair to us, but God, it doesn't have to be fair. Paul asked the same question earlier in Romans. We're not even dealing with Romans 3, but you look at it. But if our unrighteous highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? I use a human argument. If God is unrighteous, to, is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? These are the kind of things that we see happening. God's using these people to bless his people. Again, this type of question always, when you see this question in the Greek, it's worded in such a way that it always implies a negative answer. Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. Meganoita. It was one of those things when we were in Greek class, one of the first things we learned. That if we get frustrated with the professor, we'd say, Meganoita. You know, just, maybe we're trying to be all cool. Like, you know, the only words we knew. You know, didn't really know God at that point, so we just, we were on that word, we were ready to go. And so, but this, it means absolutely not. It's emphatic. It's almost he's screaming and there's no way you can even say that. Don't even utter the words that God is unjust. Because it's not possible. You look at this, Hebrews 6. For God is not unjust and he will not forget your work and the love you showed for his name when you serve the saints and you continue to serve him. God is not unjust. No matter what you think, God is not unjust. And so at this point, if you're concerned about God's justice, you need to start looking at him. What is he saying? Maybe I don't understand him well enough. Because somehow I'm flawed in this thing. I'm thinking this is unjust, but this is a just and right God. So maybe I need to get back to his work and understand who he is. Remember, this is his autobiography. He's written this story about himself. This is not really about us. This is about who he is. So if you want to understand who God is, get back to his word. Paul says we should not even doubt God's unjustice or, or his righteousness. There's no doubt in it. So we see this. Again, this is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying is God is just. 
The second thing this morning, God is merciful. Look at verse 15. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Paul's bringing up another example of the other forefathers. He's trying to do what he can to explain God as best he can, using every illustration that he could at the time. As quickly as I can, let me say, this is what who God is. I don't got a few words because I can't write you a book here. But understand, remember this guy. Remember this guy. This is an illustration of God's justice, his righteousness. So far, Paul's been speaking from his own words, but now he quotes God in the book of Exodus. And you look at this, he says, right here, it says, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And there's some neat words here. Again, the Greek is so much clearer than the English. It's, I've, I've heard it said that the, the English is like a, a 1950s black and white TV. You can get the idea, you can kind of see what's going on. But the Greek is that you know, 50 inch HD, 1080p, with all surround sound. It makes it as clear as a bell. So if you ever have a question and don't understand it, you need to go back to the Greek. Because the Greek will give you further clarification. The word heard here for mercy is the word ilios. It means to have mercy or pity on. And there's some nuances in here. This kind of mercy means to feel sympathy with the misery of another person in such a way that you act on those feelings. And many of us have, have, have felt that kind of mercy upon someone else. We see their situation and we want to help them. We want to do something for them. If you see someone who needs help, and you find answer, you pull out your wallet and you give them a 20, or you know a friend that needs something, and you'll give them a little cash, or you'll bring over some money, we'll fix up your, your house, or your car's broken down, let me take care of that. How many people have done some things like that for us? Over the years, God has blessed me through your kind of mercy. This is what God sees. So we remember the passage in Exodus. This is where it's coming from. 33. Then Moses said, Please let me see your glory. He said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God has told Moses to lead his people. Remember this story. He told him to lead his people. But Moses is feeling inadequate. He doesn't feel like he has the ability. How many of us have felt there when we're leading people to do something for God? Every time I'm playing, please, Lord, you do this thing, because I'm not smart enough. Just not. I'll be honest with you. God, you take care of this. I'm happy following way behind you. And I'll be glad to see you do, be high lifted up in this situation. That's what Moses was saying. But he wanted that, that more connection with God. He wanted to really see God in a way that he had never been able to see. He trusted him. He knew who God was. But he wanted to see him. And so at this point we see Moses was concerned that you know, if God wasn't there, he wouldn't be able to lead his people. So God decided to bless Moses. Because he chose to and for no other reason. God didn't have to. He didn't know anything to Moses. He gave Moses his life. That's good enough for God. God walked with Moses. God protected him. He gave him up to this point all the things he needed to do the task he was at. So God didn't owe him a single thing. But God chose to bless him. And so he had mercy upon him. He saw the plight of Moses. He understood his heart. And he says, you know, because this is who you are. Because you're seeking my face, I'm going to allow you a little, little bit to see who I am. Because you'll die. You can't, you can't handle it. I'm too much for you, buddy. But I'll give you a little bit of something. If you go on the back side of the mountain, you kind of look through the side of your eyes. You'll get this thing figured out for you. Again, this is what you see God doing. And so, he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy on. The last part of this verse says, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Again, we've got Elias at the beginning. We've got Orterio at the end. A very different word. It means to have a compendium or passion on. It denotes the feeling of compassion which abides in the heart. And this is different than the first one. Very different. Again, a criminal, when he goes before a judge, will beg Elias. He will beg that. He wants the judge to lighten his sentence. He knows the judge has the ability to do this. He's hoping that he'll feel sad and have enough compassion that he will change the sentence that's about to be put down on. But we also understand that most of the time, what we end up getting is orteria, which means that all he can do is feel compassion because he's bound by the mandates and the, and the, and the statutes that are in front of him. He hasn't had the ability to change the sentence. And so we see these kind of differences here. This is what God's saying. I will show mercy and I will change the, the circumstances for anyone I choose. But sometimes I'm just going to have to understand feel compassion. I don't, I don't have to be led to do a single thing. This is God. And this is what Paul's doing to explain who God is. Again, most of the time, we just have to feel sympathy. But once in a while, God can change the circumstances around us because He loves us and He chooses to. 
This is the God we serve. So we see that God's just. The second thing, God is merciful. The third thing here, God does not act in deference of man. He doesn't have to. Look at verse 16. So that it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. God is independent and he acts with respect to his own plan and will. Rarely will he change that plan. Now we've seen, we've got plenty of good illustrations in the Old Testament. Moses is a perfect example. When he comes down and he finds all that awful stuff, God wants to destroy all those children out there in Egypt who come out of Egypt who are out there in the desert. And Moses pleads on their behalf. And God says, because of your pleading, I will spare these people. God wanted to wipe them out again. I'm sick of them. They shouldn't have done this stuff. How many times do I have to prove? How many parents you know about that? I've told you all again. I'm sick of it. I thought I brought you into the world. I can take you out. We've all heard that. Okay? This is where God is. If you understand, it makes total sense. He's frustrated. He just has restored these people. He's about to give them the greatest gift of future they could ever have because of all the things he's done. And this is what they do. They get all the little gold together to make this little nasty look. In a joke, when you've got the God of the universe showing himself in manna and a fire in the sky and lights at night. Golly, you've got this little gold thing that most people can't see. It's goofy. So God doesn't have to do act, but he can sometimes. It starts with so then. Paul's about to wrap this thought up. It does not depend. It does not depend. Now, what is it? What does not depend at this point? What is it that is as it really is the question? It is God's choice and selection. Those He offers salvation to, those He offers compassion to, those He offers mercy. It does not depend on will or effort. This entire chapter has been about God choosing whom He chooses, all from the beginning. His concern is not whether we think it's fair or not. And it has nothing to do with what you do. Again, many of us, we, we raise that hand and we walk down that aisle, we think we've made something happen. At this point, God's saying it doesn't matter on that. It doesn't matter on will or effort. Now, this is a neat thing in the Greek. It really says here at this point, it depends, it does not depend on the one willing it or the one running. Now, why did they write the word running there? Again, they do a good job to kind of give us the concept of what's being said. But we don't always know specifically what's being said. In the English, when they do the translation, they'll say most of us will never have to get, look up the word running to find out what it has to do with anything. So we'll just say will or effort. And so you see this, the word is trapantos here. And it means literally to run. It does not matter whether you will it or you're running. Paul speaks of running off as an example of staying to the end. Again, if you're a runner, you know what it is to be trekking, trying to get to the last few feet. You know what it is. You're just talking to yourself, I get a half mile. Just another quarter mile. Another thousand yards. Another hundred yards. If I can just make it another 50 feet. If you've been there, you know what that's like. And then the exhilaration of making it over that line. There's nothing better, finally, even if it's just you against the world. I'm going to just do what I can to, be, to, to beat my own body, to get to the end of this thing. If it means pressing more weight, or if it means in some kind of physical competition with someone else, just doing your best is sometimes your best reward. And so we see this. It, it, you see in 1 Corinthians, don't you know that the runners in the stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to win the prize. This may sound odd, but the concept of will and running together. But Paul's saying your determination or your endurance to get to the end will not matter a single thing to God. It won't. It all depends on Him. Again, you're going to have to wrestle with these issues and understand who God is. And maybe throwing things in front of you you've never heard before, which is all right. We all hear those things once in a while. We have to wrestle with them. Once in a while, one of you, even in Sunday school class, you'll throw a question at me. Or throw a statement at me or a, a new concept I've never thought of. Oh, I look at that. I think about that for a while. We all have to be here once in a while. Again, but in this, Paul's saying that your determination or your, or your ability to stay in the end doesn't affect God. Paul's not discounting the importance of, of faith or repentance. He's not discounting any of that at all. He's saying no amount of effort can save anyone. No amount of anything that you do. God saves those he chooses. It has nothing to do with anything that you do. God saves those He chooses. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. The best you need to memorize this verse. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not from works so that anyone can boast. Again, it would be easy for us to say how good we are and made ourselves in way, or made our way to heaven. But God says if you are saved through His grace, He gave you the ability and the, and the, and the 
the compassion to say, I'm going to save this person. And even in Romans, we've already talked about this, he even gives us the faith to accept. Everything that we need to accept Christ comes from him. And it has to be a special dispensation, a special gift that only he can give. Again, we'll watch through some of those sermons, not because you want to see me talk, but so you can keep caught up if you missed any. So we see here that God is just, we're going to last, but God is merciful. He does not act in deference of man. Finally, God uses man for his glory. Look at verses 17 and 18. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he shows mercy to those he wants to, and he hardens those he wants to harden. Now he uses Pharaoh as an example of God's independent decisions. In, he quotes from Exodus 9.16 in this point. He says, I raised you up for this reason. God is speaking to Pharaoh specifically. This is the reason you're on the throne. This is the reason that I have, from your, from your lineage, I have raised you up to do this thing. This is the reason I've given you the power. I've given you the responsibility because I'm about to use you to glorify and bless my own people. This is the whole thing. This is what Paul is trying to say. And this is what God was saying to hear. All power and authority Pharaoh has comes from God. Paul continued this later in Romans, remember Romans 13, everyone must submit to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God. And those that exist are instituted by God, whether you like our leaders or not. Love them, hate them, you have to respect them. Love them, hate them, understand that God put them in that position. And it may be to wake us up. Maybe we will become less complacent next time and we'll vote better. Whatever the reason is that you... You are happier, you're discounted on what's going on. God put that person there. So we have to respect that. But he says, I raised you up for this reason, so I may display my power in you. God raised Pharaoh up so that he could be seen as powerful. It doesn't sound fair to us. That God is using this person's ability and this person's power. He's putting him in here to show himself mighty. Where's the, where's the fairness in that? Again, yeah, it's God we're looking to. It's not about my my concept of fairness. We remember the Pharaoh story. Back in Genesis, a man named Joseph is sold into slavery. Let's get back a little bit farther. Technicolor dream coat guy, the guy with the coat, many colors. Because of Joseph's integrity, he's placed as a slave in a high-ranking official's home. He's accused of advances he didn't want because he was a handsome guy, so he goes to jail. At this point in jail, he's able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. We remember this thing. Again, he's a, a great story. The longest story in the Bible. Joseph's a great, such a great story. Because of Pharaoh, he trusts, he puts Joseph in charge of all the resources of Egypt. All of Joseph's family have to move to Egypt. Some generations later, there comes a Pharaoh that does not know Joseph. That's one of the most powerful verses in the whole Bible, I think. There comes a Pharaoh that doesn't know, know Joseph. We see that. The history's gone. Time has passed. At this point, we've got a whole bunch of of Jewish people all in Egypt, all congregated together. Joseph's family, if you look at that, his father was Jacob, of Jacob and Esau. We talked about him. Joseph and his brothers, they begin the 12 tribes of Israel. They all start in Egypt. This is where they begin. And this is where they are housed. Again, because the Israelites tend to be clannish, they aren't mixing well. And again, you shouldn't be mixing well with the world out of your God. Again, if anything we can learn from that story is that we should look different than the world. We should look separate. And this is what's happening. All of Joseph and his family, they're just, they've raised up, they're just proliferating like rabbits. There's so many of those people all around. And they, they're all being their own people. They're being like typical Jewish people would be, not mixing well with the Egyptians. So at this point, the Egyptians take them as slaves. This is 400 years past. Moses comes on the scene. Understand 400 years has passed and they've forgotten about God. They understand who he is, but they haven't seen him face to face, personally, because he's just kind of let them go on their own. Can you imagine 400 years? This nation's only 200 plus years old. And it, it's in like 20 years, the last 20 years, it seems like all of a sudden we've got, got did everything we can to forget God. Let alone 400 years. They did their best to remember the traditions. They did their best to talk about Abraham and Isaac. And they taught their grandfather Jacob. But they forgot who truly God is and the power that he has. Therefore, God raises Pharaoh. He needs to show himself in a huge and mighty way. He needs to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not release the people until they are totally convinced that this is the God of the universe. 
And sadly enough, he hardens Pharaoh's heart to such that he loses his own child. We're sparing that. Again, think about these things. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Who knows if Pharaoh would let him go? I would let him go with the first bug against him. Yeah. The first time Terminex can't come out, I'm letting those guys go. Okay? Have fun with that. I'm sick of the frog. I don't even like flies. Have fun. Take all you want. Who knows what Pharaoh would have done if God had the heart of his heart? God forced him to lose, essentially lose his firstborn child. This is the God that we serve. Where's fairness in this? Think about this concept. He has to show himself mighty. That requires ten plagues. The last is the death of the firstborn. Where is free will with reference to Pharaoh? We always talk about free will. Again, I was talking to somebody last week, not in this church, but in another church. They brought it up. I don't know. I got Where's you know, uh, free will? First of all, a good thing. Where's free will with reference to Pharaoh? And if he would do that to Pharaoh, why would he not use another lost person to affect his own people? We were all lost at one point until we accepted Christ. Let's understand here where we are, but this is not the only time. Remember in Deuteronomy, another king was hardened on this, for the sake of, of Israel. Deuteronomy 2, but Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us travel through his land. They simply, he just simply wouldn't let us go through the land. That's all he did. This is what God did. For the Lord your God has made his spirit stubborn and his heart obstinate in order to hand him over to you, as has now taken place. Where's free will with reference to King Sihon? I don't see any of it. Going on to the, the concept of jo the book of Joshua. No city made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites who inhabited Gibeon. All of them were taken to battle. For it was the Lord's intention to harden their hearts so that they would engage Israel in battle, be completely destroyed without mercy. God hardened their hearts so that they would be destroyed without mercy. Again, we're trying to look at the God that's, that we serve. We're trying to understand Him better. Does He have a plan for all of us? A specific plan that He's trying to work? Again, I don't want to get too deep and dark, but there's no way around this thing. Next week, we really get into the awful stuff. It's always beautiful stuff. It's not all. <laughs> but it gets serious. These are the verses we all want to ignore. You can't ignore. You must understand who God is. Where is free will with reference to these people? An entire army was hardened. They were all killed because God chose to harden their hearts. God's power is being shown through Pharaoh to his people, the Jews, to proclaim my name in all the earth. That's what it says. If God made large enough of a show, his people would never stop proclaiming him. God's people needed to see His greatness, yet we shouldn't be. Over and over again, we shouldn't be this. God had to show Himself to His people because He hadn't shown Himself in 400 years. It's time to wake Him up. And I'm going to have to do something big to get Him back on track. He shouldn't have to do that with us because He sent His Son. John 20, 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Those who believe without seeing are blessed. Live faith. Live your faith out. Understand what God has for you. Finally, verse 18. So then he shows mercy to those he wants to convert. God shows mercy to whom he chooses. And mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone when it's within one's power to punish or harm them. That's mercy. You give them something they didn't earn. If God did this for everyone, we wouldn't need this sentence. We wouldn't need this verse in the Bible, but he doesn't. He only shows mercy to those he chooses to show mercy to. So again, this morning, if you're in the Lord, it's time to praise Him. Thank you, God, for allowing me to see your call and accepting that. Thank you, God, for choosing me from the beginning of the foundation of the world. I don't know. Evidently, He's picking and choosing whom He'll show compassion and forgiveness for. Again, this is all connected to chapter 8 for those He predestined, He conformed, He chose. The Greek is very clear. This is working its way back to about 40 verses earlier. All of this he's been talking from the end, the middle of chapter 8. All of this has to do with this. He's further explaining it. And so we see that God hardens those he wants to. Essentially the word harden here in the Greek means to use. He uses those he chooses to use. God uses certain people at his discretion to show his greatness and his power. If God had hadn't hardened Pharaoh's heart, the Israelites would have never known truly who he was. And be reminded that there is this huge God that we've heard about. And now we can see personally. God does everything to glorify Himself and bless His people. The one thing you need to remember that all of the people that I can find in the Bible that God's ever hardened their hearts, they were not His people. He never hardened a person that accepted Him. He never hardened one of His people. 
He hardened those who didn't know him. 